Who's your question directed towards? Your, who's your question directed towards? Okay. And can you say your name as well, please? Um, I don't think he was call, claiming to be God in that passage, and um, we cannot say that the Jews necessarily understood him. In fact, the Gospels show throughout that the Jews kept misunderstanding him. In John's Gospel in particular, Jesus would say he is the Son of God, and they thought that he was claiming to be God. And Jesus said, no, I only claim to be the Son of God. Uh, John chapter 10, for, uh, for example. Um, they pick up stones to stone him, saying that he, he was a man claiming to be God. But he kept uh, explaining that he was only claiming to be the Messiah. He said, I told you who I was uh, in, in John chapter 8. And in, in verse number 40, he says, a man who told you the truth that I heard from God. So he kept clarifying, but they kept misunderstanding. In Mark chapter 2, you don't have to wait for chapter 14 to give the Jews a reason to kill him. In Mark chapter 2, uh, they, they already started to conspire to kill him because he healed a man on the Sabbath. He didn't claim to be God. He only claimed that it's a, it's a good thing to do good works on the day of the Sabbath. And they were already conspiring to kill him. So they didn't need a, a genuine reason. They were trying to kill him by hook or crook. You cannot claim that they then understood Jesus. It seems that they were deliberately misunderstanding him. Can I just add something there very, very quickly? I think, I think the interesting thing, and this ties into one of the last things that you said when I asked you a question, Shabir. I think that's a wonderful question that you ask. Because when you read Mark 14, to go, if Jesus was misunderstood, the only person he's got, we've got to thank for that is Jesus himself. Because if you read the passage in Mark 14, the high priest says, are you the Christ, the, the son of the blessed one? Jesus says, I am. Uh, echoing the divine name Yahweh and then quotes Daniel 7 you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one to go my word you think you were misunderstood I mean of all the possible answers to give when you've been asked that question in that setting um, it really does raise the question of if Jesus didn't intend to be uh, taken that way the guy quite frankly was incompetent um, because it's a lunatic answer if you don't want to be taken the way that that he was he was taken Thank you for that question. A question for Dr. Bannister, please. Can I see a hand somewhere? <laughs> okay, a text, please. Oh, that was a hand. Okay. Uh, uh, can you stand up and say your name and speak loud and clear, please? Uh, my name is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, uh, when Jesus said that uh, he does not know the when the mm. hour uh, will come, yes. the man will come back. Um, how do you explain that if he does not know the fullness of God? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd say a couple of things, Kevin. Here's the first thing I'd say. What's interesting is, again, always read the passage. Because what's interesting, when you, when you look at what Jesus is saying, the first thing is, look at what he, what he is. He's separating himself from humanity. He's separating himself from the angels. Um, so, you know, a good example in a Muslim context, if Shabir was to go to a Muslim country and say, you know, well, in terms of the last day, um, you know, uh, human beings don't know, and angels don't know, and all the prophets don't know, not even I know, I suspect people go, who do you think you are? Right there, you've differentiated. So Jesus puts himself on the side of, of God at that point. Now, is there, is there, are there some roles with it between the Father and the Son and the Godhead? I think you, that's unavoidable to, to draw that conclusion. Absolutely. But in terms of Jesus putting, putting himself on the side of God rather than non-God, the very way he frames the answer does that. If, again, if Jesus had not wanted to be misunderstood, he could have gone, well, I'm just a man, how would I know? But to say, you know, not even the angels uh, know that, and certainly not, not even I know that. There's almost this ascending order. Order of, of reality. And again, what I keep coming back to is I think all the work that's been done on early high Christology, and I encourage you to Google that term actually, that's the, the term for this new movement in understanding the Gospels, has been that the, the Jewish mindset really is all in the first century was all about how do you determine God from non-God? You've got two categories. You've got over here is everything else and over here is God. And the question is which, which box does Jesus belong in? And by the way that he talks, the titles he uses time and time and time again, he's clearly identifying himself in this box. And then as I say, third Third, fourth century uh, doctrinal development was how do we figure out how that box works um, but what's interesting is the debate was never is Jesus in that box the debate was always how does that box fit together which is interesting I'll talk more about that in my summing up
Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Ali? Um, well, yes, um, I, I, I don't think that Andy is facing the question. Saying that Jesus uh, is in the same box with God uh, it, it, it just means that he's on the same team. It doesn't mean that he is God. And, and the, his very admission that he does not know that when the hour will occur actually places him with the angels because the angels do not know. Only the Father knows, so everyone else do not know. Neither the Son nor the angels. Uh, now, Muslims, of course, do not accept the title literally Son of God. God, uh, for Jesus, but it looks like uh, Christians are not accepting this verse, which shows that Jesus does not know uh, when the hour will occur, because clearly if he doesn't know when the hour will occur, there is one thing he doesn't know, that the Father knows, and therefore he, the Son, is not the omniscient God, only the Father qualifies for that. Okay, we have a question coming in from text for you, Dr. Ali. What evidence or answer can Andy Bannister give you to make you believe that Christianity is the one true religion? We're just going to go we're gonna go over the big questions here. What would the evidence look like um, if Andy was to present an evidence tonight? What would you be looking for? Well, in, in terms of the more specific questions that we've been dealing with, is Jesus God? Uh, to begin with, if the, if the New Testament does not clearly assert that Jesus is God, then, then we do not have any good reason for thinking that he is God. See, God is not a superman. It's not that we're, we're just inventing what we want God to be like. There is a clear definition put forward by St. Anselm of Canterbury, a Christian scholar, who said that God is that be beyond which nothing greater can be conceived. I, I've mentioned this in many dialogues. I haven't found any Christian or Muslim to disagree with this simple definition of God. So starting with a simple definition like that of God, uh, it proving that Jesus is great, he is greater than Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman all put together, greater than the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or whatever, or whatever they are called, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, proving that he is so great proving that he is as great as the Archangel Gabriel doesn't prove that he is God. So we have to have at least a clear statement from the New Testament. Otherwise saying that Jesus came, he performed these great miracles, therefore he's God. That therefore here doesn't work. The ergo doesn't follow. Uh, it, it only follows that he's great. Whatever he is, he's great. But th it takes another important step to say that he's actually God. And in John chapter 8 verse 54, Jesus speaks to the Jews and he says, My father whom you claim is your God. Notice how different that is from Yahweh speaking in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Yahweh says, I am the Lord your God. Now Jesus in the New Testament says, the one who said, I am the Lord your God, that's the one who I'm calling my Father. So he's not saying, I am the Lord your, your God. So where is that statement where Jesus says, I am the, the Lord your God so, in the New Testament? There's nothing like that. That's a great question. Let me, let me chip in because it's fun with the dialogue um, going on that. <laughs> How do you follow the League of, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? <laughs> uh, reminds me, it's a funny thing, is last time, Shabir, we, we debated, you, um, you, you took five of your points from the Cinderella movie. And I feel a bit cheeky saying this. One of my, one of the, Justin Trotier, the atheist on the panel, leant over and said, we should rename you uh, Cinderella. Um, <laughs> what I would say, the answer to that, actually, for the person who, who asked it, is to go, again, if you read the New Testament, using Jewish Christology, using Jewish categories. The, the, by far the best introduction to this is Richard Borkham's little book, God Crucified. It's phenomenal because it's only 80 pages and any scholar who can write in 80 pages and you could read it in an evening wins my prize. Unlike Hurtado, you could, you know, could beat a whale to death with that book. Sorry, I'm not suggesting we do, by the way, for the environmentalists in the room. Of going, that actually it's on page after page after page after page after page, as like Raymond Brown, you know, one of the greatest New Testament scholars of the last few years, it's on every single page. And I think what's what's going on, and I think where I think the struggle that, that you're having, Shabir, is you're thinking through, okay, so Jesus has to be equal to the Father in every possible way. Whereas what the um what uh, Borkham introduces in God Crucified is a helpful term, is what's going on in the New Testament is what he calls a Christology of divine identity. And Jesus belongs to the identity of God. That's the phrase that is the most helpful to understand what's going on in the New Testament. Witnessed by the fact, for example, none of the New Testament writers can talk about God without talking about, about Jesus. The two go together. Jesus belongs to God's identity. And comparing them with each other is, just is, is to break the logic of the, of the New Testament. And so if you read the New Testament, ask so ask, answer, asking the question, does Jesus belong to the identity of God? What does that look like? Suddenly, huge amounts of it fall into place. 
Thank you. Another quick question for Andy. There's actually a couple of uh, that have come in okay. in this vein. Yeah. Uh, how do you define the Trinity in contrast to what Dr. Ali spoke about tonight? Or another question phrased it similarly, how could we speak of the Trinity or how would you speak of the Trinity uh, so as to not be a heretic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in fact, the, the great book, actually, I'm really glad that, that Shabir mentioned kind of heresy, because I completely agree. It is, you know, quite easy to try and describe the Trinity, and you invent three uh, amusing heresies before breakfast. And in fact, if you really want to have some fun with this after the evening, get onto your laptops and Google St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. A um, few of you know that one. So go. It's a really comic look at some of the bad heresies uh, throughout Christian history. And I promise I won't say, come on, Patrick, to uh, Shabir at any point for those of you who already know that uh, video um, but the book I really like on this actually is called The Cruelty of Heresy by I forget the author's name if you put it into Amazon and what's interesting he looks at some of those heresies but in particular shows why they're important um, because if you misunderstand the Trinity it's not just some vague theological conception you get wrong actually you lose a lot of God in the process. For example, if Jesus does not belong to the identity of God, then actually we can't actually fundamentally know about God. You have a God who is very like the God of deism or the God of Gnosticism, which has been an influence on the Quran, who is distant and remote. Remember in Islam, not even Muhammad had God speak to him directly when the Quran was revealed, unlike the Old Testament prophets. In the, in, in the Bible, you have this God who is earthy and engaged with reality, a God who is imminent, as well as a God who is transcendent. And that gets lost in many other conceptions of God. So to understand the Trinity, I'd recommend to take a look at that book. And there's also, because I'm a great believer in recommending resources, if you really want to think through the Trinity as a Christian, a soundbite isn't going to do it. Mike Reeves, uh, uh, Delighting in the Trinity, is a wonderful little book. That uh, He's a wonderful church historian. that will help you understand the Trinity, think about it, and get it right. It's worth reflecting and doing it properly rather than doing theology by tweet. We'll take two more questions from the floor for each of our panelists. I saw a hand up there last time. Can do you want to stand, please? Say your name and uh, your question, please. Yeah, so my name is Wesley, and my question's for Shabir. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Andy's seven points about what uh, Jesus claims about himself in terms of the title of Lord of the Sabbath. And uh, are you aware of the intertestamental literature that declares that the Lord of the Sabbath is a, is a claim that only Yahweh has because it claims to... Um, spin the cosmic orbs in their order and to raise the sun in the morning and that's why you mentioned mark chapter 2 that's one of the key reasons why the jews um, seek to kill him um, as for these uh, seven points uh, basically they boil down to saying that jesus was claiming to be somebody special and uh, later on andy said well that mo proves that he is greater than the old testament prophets uh, but my re simple response to that is proving that he's greater than the old testament prophets even if you prove that he is greater than the archangel gabriel uh, that doesn't prove that he's god i mean you're, you're getting there but but you're not quite there uh, because uh, jesus or uh, you know can be great and yet not be god the archangel Gabriel is great, but he is not God. Michael is great, but not God, and so on. So we, we need some identity statement. Jesus is God, and and that is the identity statement that is uh, that is quite lacking. And Andy has been uh, unable to provide through our whole discussion here so far. And uh, as for some teasing, while well, Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath, and somebody understood this based on what was uh, de being discussed in the intertestamental period, and they took that to mean that he's claiming to be God. Well, that does not really wash because uh, in, in the end, Jesus is claiming, I do not know when the hour will occur. And that is a clear admission that he's not God. Uh, moreover, in, in the same gospel, according to Mark, uh, in chapter 10, verse number 17, a man called him good, a good teacher. And he said, why do you call me good? No one is good, but God alone. Uh, th this is a clear admission that Jesus himself is not God. Uh, the, the one that he was praying to is the almighty God. Now, Jesus goes down on his knees and prays, according to Luke's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, he falls on his face and prayed, uh, in, in, uh, just as Muslims do to this day. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. In, in John's gospel, Jesus looks up to heaven and prays and declares the one he's praying to as the only true God and himself as the Messiah, uh, which means just simply uh, one who is set aside for uh, the service of God, uh, but, but obviously not God himself. So it's very clear that uh, Jesus is not declaring himself to be God, but quite the contrary. Can I say something very quickly? response? 
response. Um, I find first thing, a couple of things I find interesting. One is that you know the the sort of pressure is on me. Show where Jesus said I am God. But of course I could turn to you and say, show me where Jesus says I am not God in that exact phrase. And the answer is he he doesn't. We have to look at what he does say. I do find it interesting that you seem to have no problem with Jesus going around going, my words are greater than Torah. I am equivalent to divine wisdom. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You don't need the temple. I am the replacement for the temple. Uh, we could look in Luke, uh, where, and we'll talk about this in my closing statement, where Jesus claims to be embodying the return of Yahweh. And uh, your view, Shabir, is to go, oh, he was just maybe thinking he was greater than an angel. And then goodness knows why all those first century Jews either got irritated with him or worshipped him. I can't imagine why. To go, I have to say, Jesus could have done with a better PR advisor or a better theological advisor in terms of the claims, because in terms of the Jewish context and scholarship means looking at what Jesus said in his context, that, thank you Wes, that's good scholarship, that's how we understand who Jesus is, not quote mining and not cherry picking. Another question for Dr. Bannister, please. There. Oh, right at the back. I, with the white oh, sorry, hat, yeah. stand up. Yeah, we can go do ahead. It. Go, ahead. Yeah. Go, for, go for it. Yeah. Can you stand up and yeah. say it nice and loud, please? Okay. Um, just kind of came to mind. I'm wondering if Jesus really wasn't God in the flesh, and he really is who you said he was, a great prophet, and he recognizes his place being below God. Why did he never once even so much as hint or mention the name Allah? In all, in all the okay. So uh, the name Allah obviously is an Arabic word, and um, it, it refers to um, the, the one true God, the God of Abraham. And today, um, Arabic-speaking Muslims and Christians and Jews uh, use this term Allah uh, for for God. The corresponding term in in Syriac, in which Jesus spoke, uh, would have been Elo, and uh, or. Um, something of this nature. I'm a little bit vague now, but uh, we know that from the cross, uh, Jesus is reported to have said, Eli, Eli, uh, lema sabachthani, uh, my, my, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is another uh, clear uh, indication that Jesus regarded someone else as his God. And, and the term Eli, actually, uh, Elo in the Hebrew, is a close uh, equivalent to uh, the Arabic Allah, which is uh, basically El with the def definition article al el al allah uh, basically uh, ilah is the corresponding arabic for el and al ilah is the is the combination the definite article plus al ilah which means the god so basically jesus on the cross was calling out to allah and uh, that that shows that he has a god and he was calling out to that god in his moment uh, of uh, distress and that proves that he himself was not god regardless of whatever else you might say about him can I because yeah you tried to direct it partly to, to me as well let me say a couple of things obviously in terms of what Jesus was crying out of the cross he was quoting from the Psalms from Psalm 22 and also Psalm 110 gets picked up in other places as well worth looking at those one thing I'd say very quickly that was a good great thank you for the, the linguistic summary there I was thinking glad I don't have to answer that one because my, 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 my Arabic uh, etymology briefly uh, eluded me but one thing is interesting just on what you say one thing that's often missed of course is in the Old Testament and the New Testament throughout the Bible we don't just have uh, God's title you know, uh, you know uh, the, the, the Ilar or Elohim or so on and so forth. We also have God's name. And so in Exodus chapter 3, of course, you know, is the famous story of the burning bush where, where God reveals his own personal name, Yahweh, to Moses. And that name turns up, I think, from memory. Is it 4,328 times in the Old Testament? I used to actually know the figure. That's demonstrably wrong, but at least sounds impressive. Unless you're sitting next to someone with a BSc in maths and a calculator. Interesting thing, though, Interesting thing, it doesn't turn up in the Quran. And I've always found that fascinating. And I think one reason being, of course, is Muhammad interacted with the Jewish communities there in Arabia. The Jews became very protective about the divine name Yahweh. They wouldn't pronounce it. In fact, Jews, faithful Jews today just call it the name. They won't, they won't say it. And so there was no surprise in one sense 
that when the Jewish community encounter Muhammad, who claims to be a prophet like the Old Testament prophets, which they, they don't believe that and they reject him, and of course that sets up all the tension between Islam and Judaism, um, to go, of course, the last thing the Jews are going to do is tell Muhammad the name of God. And that's actually the fact that the name Yahweh doesn't occur in the Arabic text of the Quran, even though Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages, is, I think, a very big clue um, that actually we're not dealing with revelation, we're dealing with things we can explain through oral tradition and other mechanisms. Are we out of time? Oh, okay. We have another question from, uh, from text here for Dr. Bannister. Yeah. Uh, there's a point when Jesus is being crucified and it says that God looks away from him because of all the sin that he bears. How is this possible if Jesus is God? Yeah, oh, what a wonderful question. Because, of course, that gets right to the whole question of why it is that Jesus came. And as well as the you know, various kind of lofty titles and things that would be, frankly, outrageous uh, in the case of Jesus, uh, were they not true? The other thing that Jesus consistently claimed to be doing was coming to do something about the problem of sin. And the interesting thing, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this at the end. The interesting thing about sin, of course, is it's um, a universal human problem. And as somebody once said, of course, sin is the one empirically verifiable Christian and, I suppose you would say, Muslim doctrine. Just look around us. Um, if it's not Donald Trump, it's Donald Trump. And, um, you know, look at the world that we're in. And so now the question becomes, what is God going to do about that? And, of course, one of the issues is that uh, the Bible teaches that we have a God who is a God who is holy and righteous. We also have a God who is forgiving and, and merciful. And the problem is, of course, is that forgiving and forgiveness and mercy and justice are actually contradictory to one another. If God is going to be a God who's holy and righteous, he can't simply overlook sin. And in a nutshell, the incredible news about what Jesus did, and Jesus talks about this in places like Mark 10, 45, he talks about it in the Last Supper tradition and elsewhere, that Jesus saw his role as being the one who would come, step into our place, offer to bear our sin, so that God could cast judgment on it, deal with it, and God could forgive us, while also being a God who is just. And actually, interestingly, the Quran has an echo of that in Surah 1715, where it says this enigmatic little phrase that no bearer of sin uh, can bear the sin of another. And it's fascinating that in both the Muslim tradition and the Christian tradition, Jesus is the only sinless one. I remember early on in my Islamic studies being fascinated uh, by that. If you look at the earliest tafsir, earliest commentary on the Quran, um, this idea that the other prophets were sinless comes much later in Islam. It's the idea that Jesus is a sinless one uh, is there in the, uh, in the traditions. So that's why um, that, that, uh, that, that's there. The Cross of Christ by John Stott is the book to read if you really want to dig into that. Oh, he's looming. St. Michael. <laughs> Did you want to respond to that? Um, well, just yeah. we can take we can take one. Sure. Uh, and, and, and of course, the Quran in, in Surah 17, verse number 15, "La taziru wa ziratun wizra ukhra," and no bearer of uh, of burdens will bear another's uh, burden. Uh, that that is very different from the Christian understanding. The Muslim understanding is that no one dies for anyone else's sins. God forgives sins, and if we get forgiveness by seeing, being sincere in our repentance, by repairing the harm we've done to other people, asking God for His forgiveness, and uh, following up with uh, with good deeds. Now, I believe that our Christian friends have to do the same things, even though they believe that Jesus died for their sins. You still have to do good deeds, you still have to repent, you still have to ask God to forgive you, you still have to repair the harm you do to other people. So what difference did the sacrifice of Jesus make? Now, I want to go back to Andy's point about mythology. Um, and, and this is a myth that was introduced by St. Paul in his writings, and they are found in the Gospels. The Gospels have become uh, passion narratives with long introductions. They want to prove that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Uh, but uh, think about it. it. It doesn't make any difference that Jesus died for the sins of the world. If Adam sinned and that got us driven out of paradise, then Jesus' sacrifice should have righted that, that wrong, and we should have been back in paradise. Uh, and of course, uh, the Garden of Eden is somewhere in Mesopotamia, somewhere in Iraq, uh, and uh, our first parents were naked. So if we go back to that original state, we will all be you know, in, in Iraq right now. But of, cor of course, it didn't happen. Uh, the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus did not re, uh, re, uh, restore anything. And, and we still have to do the same things that we did before. Uh, Christians might say, well, the one sacrifice canceled all of the temple sacrifices. But did you realize that uh, up to the year 70, while the temple was still standing, Christians continued to offer sacrifices in the temple. Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament is evidence for that, up to chapter 21, showing that even Paul, when he came to Jerusalem, joined in the temple sacrifices. So the sacrifice of Jesus didn't change anything. Thing. This is a, a theology introduced by St. Paul, and, and I would classify this under the mythologies uh, that we talked about.
Excellent questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll take two more from the floor. Uh, one up there in the corner. Yep. Good question. I, quite simply, I would say, what was your name, by the way? Roshan. Okay. I would say, quite simply, it's answered by, I don't know if you, you said you came in late? Yeah. Okay. So I actually answered it a few moments ago when I talked about the, the model that we see throughout all of the, got throughout the Gospels um, and throughout the later New Testament is what uh, is increasingly being called um, a Christology of Divine Identity. And in fact, I, I waved around, you, you may have missed it, the, 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 the standard book on you know, Christian worship of Jesus, Larry Hurtado's book, is quite fun. It's a little sort of clue in the front. He dedicates it to the EHCC. And I always wondered what that was. And then one of my professors, when I was studying theology, had a mug on his desk with EHCC on it. I was like, what is EHCC? He grinned, he went, oh, Early High Christology Club. It's this whole movement in New Testament scholarship that's happened in the last, probably last 20 years or so, that has begun realizing, it's pretty obvious really, that we should be reading the New Testament in Jewish categories. And there, what the New Testament is doing is including Jesus within the identity of God. It's not playing Jesus off against God. It's not using later language like Jesus is God. The whole question the Bible sets out to answer is, who is God? That's actually the question the Old Testament sets out to answer. Who is God? He's not some abstract concept as, a, as an Islam who sits up there in heaven and not doesn't even come and interact with anybody. He's a God who's earthy and real. He's a God who walks and talks with Adam and Eve, a God who walks and talks with Abraham, a God who's there at the burning bush with Moses, uh, a God who grieves and gets in, involved with his people. Who is this God like? And the New Testament picks that, that up and carries on and, in, and says that Jesus belongs within that identity. Jesus belongs to the identity of God. Now within that, yes, Jesus saw his role as the son uh, sent by his father and anybody reading that through Middle Eastern Jewish eyes would have no problem uh, with the idea that there's a sort of hierarchy uh, of roles going on there. We see the same in Philippians 2. But the question is, is that New Testament picture accurate? And we see it, as I say, on page after page. After. That's the striking thing. It's there in Mark, it's there in Matthew, it's there in Luke, it's there in John, it's there in Acts. You quote Acts at me, you know, Acts, we have Peter describe Jesus as the author of life. I mean, my word, talk about putting somebody in the, within the divine identity. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. Does that mean there are texts we have to wrestle with? Yeah, there are. In the same way that we have to think hard about Tawheed uh, in Islam and how that fits with an uncreated Quran and so forth. But where did Jesus consider he fitted? Did he, did he consider himself in that special relationship to God? Yes, I think so. One last very quick example, then I hand back to Michael. Think of the twelve. When Jesus picks the twelve disciples and reconstitutes Israel, which is what every New Testament scholar I've read thinks he's, thinks he's doing, who is it who constitutes Israel in the Old Testament? It's Yahweh who brings Israel together, and here we see the twelve there in the New Testament, Jesus writes at the middle of it. Not one of them, not first among equals, not Wonder Woman, certainly, and, um, but, uh, but it's the one who draws it all together. And the more you see this pattern, you see it everywhere. It's, uh, it's incredible. I literally am far more confident about the divinity of Jesus uh, now than I was 10 years ago because I've spent so much time now immersed in this uh, new wave of literature. It's exciting stuff. Go read Balkan, go read Hurtado. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that question. Do we have a question for Dr. Ali? <laughs> I think we have one in the front here. Did you have a question? <laughs> Can you say your name and stand up, please, nice and loud, so everybody can hear? Sure. Um, my, my name is Dylan Simon. I have a question for the both of you, actually. Um, it's about, um, what do you, the both of you think about the theories about King um, Zedekiah um, and his encounters with um, Abraham and how that could relate to um, the possibility of, um, of him being a different form of God, not Abraham, but King Zedekiah? And this will be the last question. Yeah. Uh, are you referring to the story in Genesis 18 where Abraham is visited by these three persons? And uh, is that the story? Because I, somehow I can't tie King Zedekiah. I can't either, actually. Melchizedek. Yeah. Melchizedek. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Malik Sadiq. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Well done, that man. This is a bit of a last-minute question. I was trying to think. Is it Melchizedek? Okay. Is it Zedekiah's 
Yeah, 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 no, you can't. Okay. Yeah, do you want to go first on that? No, no, okay. I'll let you, by all means. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Together we got this. Yeah. Um, actually, your, your question illustrates uh, a, a, a point that um, sometimes uh, Christians are looking back in the Old Testament for some sort of proof or evidence that God came down on the earth, walked among human beings he, um, as a human being himself. But the description in, in the book of Genesis is simply that there was this um, Malik Sadiq, uh, Melchizedek, we be Anglicized his name to be. Um, he was king of Salem. Um, Abraham uh, paid tribute to him, but uh, that's about it. He's an ordinary human being, a king, but, but nothing to say that this was God here on earth. Yeah, I actually agree with where Shabir ended. I don't, I don't think there's any sense there. I don't think any sense in the text, actually. I think where the imagery that you're probably picking up is from the book of Hebrews. And most uh, commentators on the book of Hebrews think that, that obviously what's going on, in fact, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious when you read it that what's going on is uh, the writer of Hebrews is interacting with an audience who are perhaps tempted to go back to Judaism. And a lot of commentators think probably what's this is written um, during one of the, the early waves of Roman, Roman persecution that had begun. I alluded to this actually with, um, with Pliny the, young, the Younger. And uh, the Romans took grave uh, exception to Christians, largely because they refused to worship Caesar. And the test was very simply, okay, worship Caesar and curse Christ. If you don't, then it's uh, you know, off to the lines with you. And, the, the, uh, and there are lots of clues within the text that uh, I think it's got, you know, things have got so heated that a lot of people are thinking, okay, maybe we should get back to Judaism. It was easier there. And so the writers of the Hebrews is really showing how everything in the Old Testament is actually foreshadowing and pointing uh, forward to, to Jesus. And, uh, and, and basically then he picks up this story of Melchizedek and really just uses it to sort of riff off into this idea of Jesus as the heavenly high priest standing there uh, at the right hand of God there in the, on, the, on the throne you know in Daniel chapter 7 the imagery that Jesus set up and of course that's a huge encouragement to those of us who are Christians because the idea that we have uh, you know Jesus has still got that human form we have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way and so Jesus looks at you looks at me and can understand what it means to wrestle with sin because he wrestled with sin was tempted in every way and didn't fall um, with anyone to, to have done that and thus he is not carrying his own burden and can carry our burdens. But nowhere does the text sort of say, and therefore, you know, Melchizedek was God in any, any sense. It's just playing with this idea that here's this mysterious figure in the Old Testament and then sort of connecting it, like a sermon il il illustration. And I think if you, just, if you read uh, Hebrews chapter 7, that's, um, that's pretty clear. Uncle, if you, if you allow me, just one, one uh, short follow up of that. Uh, perhaps you were intrigued by the mention that he was without be be beginning of days or end of life, uh, no genealogy, and mm. so on. But uh, I wouldn't build too much on yeah. that. Okay. Where we have begun, I want to emphasize again that uh, Muslims and Christians can work together to make our world a better place. Of course, differences in theology uh, should not prevent us from working together. Uh, but I've contended tonight that uh, if, if Christians uh, can um, come to uh, what the Bible actually says about Jesus, then that will bring Christians closer to Muslims, in that Christians would then affirm that despite whatever else you can say about Jesus, Jesus is actually not God. You might say that he's very great, you might say he's the son of God, not that Muslims will accept any of this, but to Muslims it will make a great deal of difference that you are still affirming that there is only one God, and there we hear no confusion when you say that, because if you say that Jesus is God, now we're hearing two. And if you try to explain it to us, uh, it seems that the explanations are recondite. And I uh, noticed that Andy, when he had the chance to explain the Trinity, he, he just pointed to books that explain the Trinity. Uh, it, perhaps he was afraid that if he explained the Trinity, he might fall into one of the heresies that he talked about. And so, so this is a difficulty. Now the difficulty doesn't only come when you try to explain it, but when you come to think about it. Now of course we, we cannot think wrong thoughts about God, and we cannot imagine somebody else to be God that is not God. The Old Testament uses the analogy of marriage for our relationship with God, and turning to a false God would be uh, uh, not only idolatrous, but adulterous according to the Old Testament uh, thinking. So think about your own marriage then. Uh, can you think of some other person as being your spouse and can you have some confusion as to who actually is your spouse? No, in the mind it has to be very clear. So when Muslims say that there is only one God, Allah, it is very clear to Muslims whom we're referring to. Uh, but uh, when our Christian friends say that uh, Jesus is God and the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God, it, there seems to be some lack of clarity. Are these three separate gods? Are there three uh, individuals working together as a team? Is the team stronger than any of the individuals? 
individuals by themselves and so on. So thinking about it uh, is like walking on a tightrope. You either fall into one heresy or the other. Either you, you emphasize the distinctiveness in which you seem to have three gods, or you minimize the distinctiveness in which you, in which case you fall into Sabellianism or modalism, in which you don't anymore have three persons. You have one God, yes, and you have the three modes of existence, but you no longer have the Trinity and you do not have actually three persons. And then you cannot explain why was Jesus on the earth worshiping the Father if they are not actually two. Uh, so there are great difficulties. Now, I want to pick up some of the pieces that uh, were discussed in the Q&A. Somebody asked about Mark 14 again, and this picks up on Andy's point. When Jesus was under trial and he was being asked, are you the Christ, son of the, the blessed? And he says, I am. Well, he's not saying I am God. He's saying I am Christ and son of the blessed. Now, of course, Muslims will not accept that Jesus is literally the son of God. But if Christians accepted that and didn't go the further step and say, well, he's actually God whose son he is. Uh, well, well, then uh, Muslims and Christians would actually be closer together because Christians in that case would not be asserting that Jesus is God. They would only be asserting that Jesus is the Son of God. And then Jesus spoke about the Son of Man who will come in the clouds of heaven. Now, as Bruce Chilton has pointed out in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus speaks about the futuristic coming of the Son of Man, he is actually referring to someone else in the third person. He doesn't say, I will come on the clouds of heaven. He's speaking about the the son of man who will come, referring to this in the third person, as someone else as the son of man. Who is this mysterious son of man and when he will come, that's a different question. But in Mark's gospel, as Bruce Chilton ably proves, there is no instance where Jesus, in speaking about the futuristic son of man, is actually referring to himself. It's always in the third person, obviously referring to someone else. Uh, so in, in conclusion, I want to say that the points that we have discussed here tonight are very important. We ask, is Jesus a man, a, a myth, or is he God? And I've said that we agree that he's a man. We also agree that in the popular sense of the term myth, Jesus is not a myth. He actually existed in history. When it comes to the other meaning of myth, the academic meaning, I, in our discussion, a lot of things came up. For example, the change of the crucifixion date to represent Jesus as the Passover lamb, uh, which is mythical. The idea that Jesus dies for the sins of the world and so on. And then finally, I have laid good ground to show that there are clear statements in the New Testament indicating that Jesus is not God, the clearest one in the, being Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, which shows that he is not omniscient. And I would beg Andy to interpret the rest of the Bible in the light of the clear statements. That's the basic hermeneutics 101, and that uh, obscure statements should be interpreted in the light of the clear. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just uh, get set up here. Okay. Fantastic. So five minutes. Well, I'm glad that we've spent most of our uh, time this evening as we've thought about Jesus talking about the Bible and uh, not the Quran. Let me begin my comments there because, of course, the Quran can't help us here. Let me illustrate what I mean, actually, with a little thought experiment. Imagine that in AD 1300, back in the Middle Ages, 700 years after Muhammad, uh, in France, a man appears who speaks no Arabic. Uh, he's only Parisian French. He's never read the Quran. Uh, he's never read the Sirah. He's never read the Hadith. And he begins telling Muslims that they've got Muhammad entirely wrong and they should follow his interpretation of Islam. Nobody would take that seriously for a moment and that's why as Bartim and the uh, biblical scholar and atheist says that's why nobody takes the Quran seriously for understanding Jesus. We also must be reminded as well that of course Islam is not actually related to Judaism or Christianity but is actually an entirely different worldview. For sure it has borrowed terminology but out of that has built something unique. In fact many scholars are now beginning to use the term creolization uh, to describe Islam comparing it to how for example uh, Haitian Creole languages took the French vocabulary, bolted on an entirely different grammar and syntax, with the result that now what is spoken in Haitian Creole sounds like French, but it isn't. 
As the linguist and historian Dr. Mark Dury explains, he says the relationship of the Quran to the Bible is like that of a Creole language to its superstrate, such as, for example, the relationship between Haitian Creole and French. A great many similarities can be readily observed, but the deeper meanings and structures of the Creole are not French. Similarly, Islam's genesis, as reflected in the nature of its foundational scripture, the Quran, did not come about by a process of organic development out of Christianity, Judaism, or even a form of Jewish Christianity instead of the Quran is the outcome of a uniquely creative process, the genesis of an entirely new religion. And the difference there is shown by the fact that throughout the whole of early Christian history, every Christian group that we know of, Jesus was worshipped. In fact, the problem was never that Jesus was divine. That was never the problem. The problem at times was how to make sense of his humanity. As Raymond Brown put it, he said, all scripture texts assume that Jesus knew who he was and acted with sovereign authority. And as we have seen, this goes back to Jesus himself, who in dozens of ways demonstrated his identity. And for Shabir, for Shabir simply to go, well, he can't have been God, so he can't have meant, he meant that. He must have meant anything other than being God is simply a gross misreading of the text. The earliest Christology is very high, very Jewish, and comes from Jesus. Now, in their book, Putting Jesus in His Place, Robert Bowman and J. Ed Komazewski offer a helpful acrostic to help remind us, and for you guys to take away, why Jesus and the early Christians who worshipped him thought that he belonged to the identity of God. We can use the acrostic hands, A-H-A-N-D-S. H, Jesus uh, received, uh, Jesus is honoured, the honour uh, like, like God received in Judaism went to Jesus. He was worshipped all across early Christianity in the New Testament and this goes back to Jesus himself. A is for attributes. Jesus is regularly described with God's attributes, creator of all things, ruler of all things, and Jesus believed that he could forgive people, uh, save people, that he was Lord of the Sabbath, and so on. N is for name. God's name is directly applied to Jesus, Philippians 2, and so forth, and Jesus himself actually applies it when he uses the Greek form of Yahweh and applies it to himself in passages like John 8:58. D is for deeds. Jesus does the things that God said he would do. Perhaps most famously in Luke 19 verse 44, Jesus claims that he is embodying in his ministry this long hoped for return of Yahweh to his people. And lastly, S is for seat. According to Jesus himself and according to the early Christians, uh, Jesus ascended to sit on Yahweh's throne in heaven. But in closing, let me add a final S, saves. You know, we all need a saviour. Because all of us are sinful human beings. I certainly am. Shabir certainly is. Each of us here is separated from God by our rebelliousness and our self-centeredness. Even Muhammad struggled with his sin. We read in the Hadith that Muhammad would pray, O Allah, wash away my sins with the water of snow and hail. Cleanse my heart from all sins as a white garment is cleansed from the filth. And so forth. We all need a saviour. But saving is, of course, God's prerogative. Only God can save. And thus, in conclusion, I am so grateful to Jesus, who is not just my Lord, who, I'm, who I worship as 2,000 2, years of Christians have done throughout history, but he is also my saviour, he is also my friend, who has offered me salvation, turned my life around, and can turn yours around too. Thank you for listening. So patiently encourage you to download my slides with all of the quotes and the references uh, up on the website later on, and you can revisit this at your leisure. It's been a pleasure being with you this evening. Thank you.